Hello, everyone. I see that we. Hola a todos. Creo que estamos listos. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Meeks on behalf of Pacific Corp. We welcome you to our second Clean Energy Plan Engagement Series meeting. We look forward to provide a preview of our Clean Energy Plan and have discussions on the pathways to Oregon's zero emission targets. With that, I will hand it over to our facilitator, Morgan Westbury from eSource. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start by ask that everybody who is not speaking be on mute because we have some echoing going on. So hopefully we can get that fixed for Okay, let's try this. Okay. Um, can we please have Ernesto Cadiz mute yourself just for now? Um, or move into the translator uh segment. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and everybody else. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, welcome to our second iteration of the engagement series. We are um, very excited to have you all. Um, for a better meeting experience and uh, to increase accessibility, we both will be recording this meeting and providing Spanish and American Sign Language um, translation. If you need to or prefer to use those translations, feel free to navigate to the interpretation side at the bottom of Zoom. Select ASL under watch or Spanish under audio. And if interpretation icon is missing, then you can hit the more icon, which should allow that to pop up for you. Um, for technical support, you can feel free to chat Kara Perkins from eSource, um, which will be out, who will be our technical expert and be able to help troubleshoot some of those issues for you. Um, lastly, like I mentioned, please stay muted until you're speaking. Um, we will be accepting questions throughout the discussion as well as at the conclusion of it. So feel free to drop those in chat um, and we will address them uh, as we see them. Um, other than that, you can raise your hand in the toolbar if you prefer to communicate verbally. Um, we have our agenda up on the screen. As you will see, we will be touching on different clean energy plan topics, including pathways, the different community benefit indicators, um, resilience, community-based renewable energy, and the different external engagement that are occurring at the moment. 
Um, then, like I mentioned, we will also be having public comments and talking about next steps. So we are very excited to be here with you and to hear all of your feedback. And with that, uh, let's kick it off. And we'll be handing it off to uh, Matt McVee. If you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and Right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, good afternoon. I'm Matt McVie. I'm vice president of regulatory policy and operations for Pacific Corp. Um, so I, I deal with the interaction of the company with the commission in working on implementing um, state energy policy and uh, addressing those issues and essentially all of the, the rate proceedings, the policy proceedings um, before the commission, I, I uh, coordinate those and work within the company to make sure that that we are not only implementing policy, but also that you know we're trying to develop the you know the service in the, the least cost manner that we can that we can. Um, so just on this slide, you know this is part of our engagement series. Um, this is I believe the second meeting. Um, what we plan to do is give you a brief on the clean energy plan, um, socialize the pathways that we're looking at to get to the energy policy of 80% um, reduction in emissions by 2030, um, moving to the 90% 2035 and the 100% by 2040. Um, and then deepen an understanding of some of the other topics that we've, we've addressed in other meetings um, with other parties. But the goal of this is to, to try to bring it together. So we're having uh, you know, kind of a, a, a dialogue to discuss um, all of these issues as we continue to build this plan. So uh, those will include community benefit indicators, um, community benefits and impact advisor group, the CBIAG, um, resilience, and then the community-based renewable energy. So if you go to the next slide, or do I have control? Thank you. So. For those that are not familiar with Pacific Corp, um, we're a multi-state utility. Uh, we serve uh, nearly 2 million customers across six states. That's Oregon, Washington, California, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah. We have an extensive and diverse portfolio of generation resources, transmission and distribution infrastructure across the West that enables us to leverage geographic and climate, uh, climate and resource diversity across our system and provide reliable and affordable power to our customers. Um, Pacific Core system decarbonization efforts are already underway with our continued addition of renewable generation to serve load and an extensive portfolio of energy efficiency resources. You know, we accomplish this through uh, long term planning. We um, conduct a 20 year resource planning effort called our Integrated Resource Plan or IRP, which we update every two years, and the most recent having just been filed by the company. So while I'm still on this slide, I did want to um, kind of raise one issue to kind of preview it, because one of the things that um, is unique for Pacific Core is that as you'll notice, all of the little dots on those, those are our resources. So we dispatch for our entire system and then we allocate the cost. So you're gonna hear a little bit about allocations as we go through this presentation. And the, when we talk about allocations, it's because we dispatch as a system we're able to do that across the entire network. We can get access to high capacity wind um, in Wyoming, um, which is important for renewables because that means that you can um, rely on that power more often. And then we can get access to some of the power in the Southwest and we have access to markets across all of that, all while it's the energy is being transferred on our system rather than across multiple systems. And but when we dispatch for our, the entire system, what we then have to do is allocate the costs. So the costs follow the benefits. Uh, essentially, in how we've done this is it's been after the fact. We own the resources or we contract for the resources. We dispatch those resources. And then the costs get allocated to each state based on their proportion of the, of the load. So if there's more load in one state, then that more of those costs will go to that state because that state's getting more of the benefits of all of those resources. So the issue is that we have system resources which go to all states and serve all states. And then we have what is called CITUS resources. And those are resources that serve one particular state. Uh, 
the issue for us is that has always been an after the fact analysis. Um, now that we're starting to forecast compliance and where we're gonna be, you're gonna hear a little bit more about that because what we're looking at now is instead of looking backwards when you know actual, um, we're having to forecast what may the load be at that future period. And so you'll hear a little bit about allocations and I'm here to answer any questions about that um, because it's an ongoing dialogue with the states uh, to determine, well, what is a fair allocation? Um, you know, how do we allocate these costs? Who should get the costs and benefits of these resources? And we do believe that there's, there's some significant benefits about that. And I can discuss that on the next slide. So while the IRP illustrates our plan to decarbonize our whole system, um, our clean energy plan is going to address the specific efforts for Oregon. So Oregon's energy policy sets a faster pace for decarbonization. And this, of course, creates certain challenges because then we have a discrepancy between the system and the state. But these are generally going to be temporary in nature uh, as we decarbonize the system, as the entire Western interconnection um, decarbonizes, it becomes less and less of an issue. Uh, but it does create some challenges that we have to be mindful to make sure that all of our customers um, are not harmed. Uh, as we go through this process. So some of those specific challenges are, um, you know, Oregon's contribution to assistive energy, load growth, and um, Oregon's specific requirement for small scale renewables. So when we're talking about the contribution to system capacity, what that really gets to is how is uh, Pacific Core has certain legal obligations um, and just reliability obligations um, that are really incorporated into federal law that we have to maintain the reliability of our system. And in order to do that, to meet resource adequacy, to meet, to meet our reliability standards that are enforced by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, we have to have, um, we have to meet certain requirements. We have to have certain uh, energy resources and the capacity from those to be able to respond to the operations of the grid. Um, when load goes up, we need to be able to respond. Um, when the resource is lost, we have to be able to respond. So we have to make sure that there is an adequate um, contribution from each state. Otherwise you get what's called leaning where one state is essentially not paying its fair share um, for those resources. Now, as technology develops, what we're hoping is that those move towards more non-emitting resources. Um, load growth is another issue. Um, you know, that's normally as it's, uh, if we can forecast low growth, um, then that is something that we can plan for. We incorporate that into our IRP and we can incorporate that into the CEP. Um, but low growth doesn't always occur in a way where you can predict um, so far out in the future. And so one of the complications that we run into is if you have a short-term low growth or low growth is larger than expected, is then how do you provide the energy to that new load um, in the short term. In the long term, you can build resources, you can contract for resources, you can address that. Um, but when it's new, then the question is, you either have to use your existing resources, um, which it depends on what you have. And if you have a, you know, a, a few, a dispatchable resource, a resource that you can increase the fuel, increase the generation from that, then you can use, you can use that. Otherwise, you're going to have to buy in the market. And so there's complications that come with that because uh, Renewable resources generally aren't dispatchable, although you have some flexibility depending on the type of resource. And then the small scale resources, they, they present some challenges, um, you know, as regarding siting and cost, um, but then that can be offset by some local benefits. Um, but we do have to be mindful about how we incorporate those and what the cost impact will be. Now, despite those challenges, we believe that we have a lot of opportunity to address this. I mean, everyone um, that's participating here, we can get um, you know feedback and have a dialogue and start to come up with ideas. Um, we, you know, we don't believe that any of these are insurmountable. We just have to be mindful and work through those. We also believe that, as I discussed before, the the expansiveness of our system um, it allows us to balance some of those challenges against each other. We can develop small scale. Um, we can find least cost areas and then balance those out with kind of CBREs um, that may be a little bit more expensive, but provide some localized benefit. And then we can, um, we can also use um, kind of the efficiencies of scale to get utility size renewable resources and put them in various places 
so that we can spread out the risk, spread out the cost across all of our states. And then that provides a benefit because then you don't have to worry about a big lumpy construction build and having um, you know, one state kind of take that risk of that project maybe underperforming. Instead, you spread out the risk of underperforming and then you get the benefit of you know, any overproduction from those resources. So um, that's my little introduction for Pacific Corp and where we're looking. Um, you know, if there's any questions that I can answer, otherwise I will turn it to Randy Baker so he can get into the, the substance of our CEP. Thank you. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Randy Baker, Pacific Corps Director of Resource Planning. Uh, let's move to slide eight, if we can. Thank you. Let's begin uh, by taking a look at the emissions trajectory for the company. Uh, starting with the graph at the right, those blue bars that you see represent annual emissions across 40 years, where future years are based on projections. We can see that over the past 10, 13 years, there's been a significant downward trend in emissions. That downward trend is accelerated by coal resource retirements, conversion to natural gas fueling, and the influx of renewable resources. If you take a look at that orange dotted line that crosses from left to right across the graph, this shows the reduction in emissions as a percentage of the emissions measured in the year 2005. 2005, is the level represented in the green line at the top. So everything here is being measured against this 2005 benchmark. And when viewed against that benchmark, the, the integrated resource plan uh, reduces emissions by 70% compared to 2005 by the year 2030, by 87% by the year 2035, and by 89% by the year 2040. Um, per House Bill 2021, that green line for the 2005 benchmark does not move. That's the standard against which we are setting our targets. Um, and that will remain our target for emissions reductions regardless of increasing energy demand. This means that Pacific Core must not only reduce emissions, but must do so in an environment of increasing projected energy demand. House Bill 2021 therefore accelerates the company's already downward emissions trajectory. Next slide, please. The projected forecast on the prior slide is an outcome of ongoing long-term planning which includes the 2023 Integrated Resource Plan, as well as Oregon's Clean Energy Plan, uh, new to this year. In order to conduct long-term planning, we use uh, a suite of optimization soft software known as Plexos. In long-term development, excuse me, in long-term planning development stage one, shown as those three numbered bubbles off to the right on this slide, the Plexo software compares all resource options for cost and risk and generates a 20-year least cost, least risk plan. Uh, moving over to the right into the second green bubble, de development stage two, we use the same tools to add clean energy plan requirements for Oregon, and specifically the requirement to generate 10% of Oregon retail customer requirements using small-scale renewable resources. Um, in development stage three, at the far right, we evaluate the clean energy plan portfolio for emissions and focus on pathways to achieving Oregon uh, emissions reduction targets in 2030 and beyond. Um, so this is a high-level framework view of steps to get to the final clean energy plan. And I'll note that there will be some ongoing references in the next, next few slides to these development stages one, two, and three. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so let's examine stage one, the 2023 IRP preferred portfolio, uh, a little more closely in terms of study steps. And the study steps that I'm going to describe here apply equally to any study that we would model to optimize least cost, least risk solutions. So you could think of this in, this in terms of the small scale clean energy plan um, optimization. You can think of it in terms of the 2023 IRP preferred portfolio. But what we're describing here are the high level study steps that we used to reach the 2023 IRP preferred portfolio. Um, when we talk about the preferred portfolio or any resource portfolio, this means all existing resources plus all new resources selected in the Plexo study, because you have to know your existing resources in order to determine what your needs will be for new resources coming into the system. This graphic shows the three major components of creating a study to create a portfolio of resources. On the left, we have the study setup. And this is where inputs and assumptions are entered into the model. There are tens of thousands of data points that go into these models, but they fall into several major categories as shown here, uh, including, these are the green boxes at the far left, uh, a load forecast, what do we expect the requirements for energy to be going forward, uh, a price forecast, what's the price of energy going to be, um, our topology, and that is how we represent the six state territory that Matt McBee described a few moments ago, our existing resources. So we have to have all of the inputs describing how they can behave and how they contribute to the system. Uh, and also, and very importantly, potential resources. Um, what are the supply side resources going to be that in the future may be generating uh, to meet our energy needs? Um, there's also within that large green study setup box on the left, uh, a smaller box called study parameters. Study parameters are specific to each study that we perform and are used to frame up a particular scenario or assumption for what a possible future might look like. For example, in the 2023 integrated resource plan, the study setup allowed the model for choosing the preferred portfolio, um, the one that we're essentially planning to as an outcome of the 2023 integrated, integrated resource plan, um, that setup allows the model to choose the portfolio from among all modeled options. How, however, for the clean energy plan portfolio, the model was required additionally to select at least 802 megawatts of small scale resource capacity to meet the 10% minimum requirement as defined for the clean energy plan. And so that 10% requirement is an additional study parameter that the CEP portfolio had that the 2023 IRP portfolio did not. Once all of the data and parameters are loaded, the second study set step can occur, which is optimization. And this is where the Plexus model actually evaluates and selects resources to meet requirements. Uh, as you'll see on the interior of that optimization box, looking over to the right, uh, part of the step also includes an assessment of each study portfolio to make sure that it meets all reliability requirements and is legally compliant. And if there are any gaps, Plexos provides the necessary data to indicate how those gaps should be filled. Um, the third of these major steps is evaluating results, and that's the orange section at the right of this graphic. Uh, this includes validation by the integrated resource planning team. Uh, it includes analysis to be able to explain what the model did, and it also includes reporting. And I'll point out that uniform reporting is particularly important to be able to compare one study to another uh, on the basis of relative costs and risks. Uh, so that's an overview of the study steps that we engage in. Uh, if you happen to um, look at the 2023 integrated resource plan for Pacific Core, uh, there's more than 20 individual studies. They all go through the same basic series of steps. 
Next slide, please. All right. Um, on this slide, we discuss a little bit about these two key portfolios, the development stage one integrated resource plan preferred portfolio and the development stage two clean energy plan portfolio. Um, starting with number one, the 2023 IRP preferred portfolio focuses on the system-wide optimization amongst all the states. And a key purpose in performing this step on a system-wide basis is that doing so ensures that Oregon customers will continue to benefit from uh, the scale efficiencies, diversity, and flexibility of system-wide planning. If, um, if Oregon were to be isolated from the rest of the Pacific Core system, uh, costs would significantly go up as Oregon would have less access to a flexible and diverse portfolio of resources. Uh, moving over to the right on development stage two, um, where we create a CEP portfolio uh, by adding small scale resources. Um, this is done to meet that 10% requirement that I've already mentioned. That requirement uh, kicks in in the year 2030, where by that time, we have to have 10% uh, of our energy supply to Oregon customers, retail customers, um, coming from these small scale resources. The small scale resources are defined as uh, being of size 20 megawatts or less in capacity. Uh, and there are some other requirements that um, are not my area of expertise, uh, but basically that is the requirement that we add in to the clean energy plan portfolio. So you can see here that the CEP portfolio includes an additional 802 megawatts of small scale resources. If we were to take that 802 megawatts and divide it up into the largest small scale resource size, 20 megawatts, then you get at least 40, just a hair more than 40 projects that would need to be uh, developed and are considered in the CEP portfolio. Um, in order to procure resources to meet future needs, um, we regularly engage in a complex process called a request for proposals or RFP. In the most recent 2022 request for proposals, small scale uh, resources were eligible to bid in their projects to the company in this competitive process. Uh, however, there were no small scale bidders in that particular request for proposals. Um, in order to achieve the small scale requirement embodied in the clean energy plan, the company plans to issue a separate small scale RFP, I believe in 2024, the upcoming year, which will emphasize both the opportunity and the need uh, for small scale developers and in order to achieve these projects. Um, and one thing that I'm gonna skip back a moment because I forgot to mention is the higher cost of small scale as compared to use utility scale resources. Um, and as Matt pointed out, um, there are some potentially offsetting benefits, but by and large, uh, by definition, a smaller scale resource is going to uh, incur more cost than the efficiencies you gain with a utility scale resource. For example, you know, simply to build 40 projects of 20 megawatt size, um, as compared to four projects of a 200 megawatt size, factors such as purchasing power and contracts, centralizing resources, uh, centralizing management um, are a few of the ways that utility scale projects would tend um, to save money. Um, if there are not uh, sufficient economic resources available from the marketplace, bid into an RFP process in order to meet the 10% requirement and find those 802 megawatts, then the company may need, may need to build these resources to ensure that the 10% requirement is met. And on to slide 12. Uh, in the last few slides, uh, so far we've looked at Pacific Horse territory, long-term planning, study steps, and resource portfolios. 
Here on slide 12, we're looking at specific study results for two main clean energy plan studies. Uh, again, the development stage one, 2023 IRP preferred portfolio, and the development stage two, clean energy plan portfolio. Um, and that's what we're looking at here on this slide. The table at the top describes small scale renewables included in the 2023 IRP preferred portfolio. And you can see at the left of that top table, SSR stands for small scale renewables. And we've got three categories. We have existing, planned, and proxy. The existing resources identified in the 2023 IRP are of course the ones that are already online, already serving customers. Uh, they're out there, they're real, and they're operating. The second category, which is planned, describes an amount that we expect to come online because it's uh, the project has already been begun in terms of development and or there are contracts signed, but there's a full expectation that it, it will become a part of the portfolio uh, in a fairly short order, gen generally within a two to four year window. Um, note that uh, the values in both these tables represent cumulative megawatts of small scale resource capacity. Um, so looking at that top table, focusing on that for a moment, you can see that uh, um, in the preferred portfolio, there are no new small scale renewables. And you can see that there's a row of zeros representing this. However, there are some existing and planned resources that fall within the 20 megawatt scale. The last row of the top table, highlighted with a gold box, shows the percentage of small scale resources um, currently used to serve our Oregon retail customers, hovering around three to, I think it's 4.6% over the years. Uh, and what this means is that Pacific Core has a good head start on meeting the small scale requirements, but there's still some distance to go. Uh, for comparison, in the second table, you can see that the Clean Energy Plan study adds that 802 megawatts of resources. And since it's cumulative on the left, it's a lower required amount, but it accelerates as you move toward the right until it hits the um, maximum 802 requirement. Uh, and it's a significant addition that shows up in that proxy row, the third row down that's also highlighted with a gold box. Um, later in the forecast, actually, let me draw your attention to the, the bottom gold box of that second table, which is the total um, small scale renewable percentage. So you can see that once we implement the clean energy plan portfolio with the additional small scale resources, we hit the 10% target in 2030 and beyond. And by the end of the study period out in 2042, we're actually uh, a couple of percentage points, one or two percentage points above the 10% requirement. So let me pause there and ask if anyone has questions regarding the last several slides uh, pertaining to our models and key studies. Yeah, so we do have one question in the chat um, that said, I think that it, um, whether you want to tackle it or we want to um, wait for Zapier, but the question is, would my 4K roof solar on my house qualify as small scale? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would hesitate to speak to the detailed requirements because I don't know them. And for the integrated I resource can cover plan. That. Oh, yeah, please, please do. Do you want to answer that now or should I turn it over to you and you can start in? I can cover it as part of my presentation. There is one additional question in there right. about small scale renewable, um, including PERPA QF. I don't okay. know if you can tackle that one. Um, I'm guessing that I can't, but what is that question? So Sylvia Tanner. Oh, uh, 
I can ask it uh, yes, if, the question. if it's easier rather than have you read my question. Um, okay. So Randy, Thank my you. question for you was whether the small scale renewables uh, include um, PERPA qualifying facilities? And if, 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 that, if the answer is yes, I was curious about whether that those 12 megawatts in the plant will reflect that you only have 12 megawatts of QFs in, you know, in the, that have met that plant criteria? Right, and, and I, I can only say I didn't produce the breakout okay. according to the requirements, but if somebody else can answer that, that would be delightful. Yeah, so I can I can take a, a try. So my name is Zipir. I'm the director of energy policy here at Pacific Core, and I'll be covering the next set of slides. Um, I can uh, try to answer your questions here. So in terms of the first question on uh, roo rooftop solar, um, that doesn't qualify for small scale because it is a, a net metering resource. Um, small scale uh, requires that um, the resource uh, must also be Oregon DEQ um, certified for RPS compliance. So um, the small scale uh, or the rooftop solar does qualify for net metering and there's specific provisions under HB 2021 related to that. Um, and then Sylvia, to your uh, question, the uh, small scale, so a, a, a perfect QF would qualify as a small scale renewable to the extent it's registered in Regis and it's producing, um, uh, it's set up for certification with uh, Oregon um, DOE. Uh, but from the planning perspective, since these are proxy resources, I don't think a distinction was made uh, to separate a QF and a non QF small scale. Thank you, Zipir. And, and can, I, can I make a quick comment um, before? I yes. mean, maybe this will be better for your presentation, but you know, one of the, one of the issues that we've been um, thinking about uh, with, this, with regards to this, um, these RFPs for community-based renewable energy resources or small-scale renewable resources, uh, you know, I, I believe they're, they can be the same scale, is that an RFP, an RFP will you know, hopefully be very successful in bringing you those projects, but it creates barriers for um, some type of development um, because you have to, you know, have met a, a bunch of benchmark in order to be able to even be considered in an RFP. And so um, we hope that this um, small scale renewables uh, concept here and in MPD, they're, they're talking about, about it as the CBRE RFP. We really hope to see those lead to lead also to projects that can have more direct benefits to environmental justice communities. And so, you know, benefits like community ownership, uh, well creation. And, um, and so I would love for the company to think how, you know, it can either layer on top of its uh, RFP idea or, um, or maybe within its RFP idea, um, some sort of programmatic support or, or some sort of a mechanism so that you can support the type of, of projects as well, because it's an RFP, as we traditionally know it, will likely not. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have the RFP or that the RFP is not a desirable mechanism. I'm saying that maybe it should be the RFP plus, um, you know, some brainstorming on how we can make sure that in meeting this, um, this SSR um, um, thresholds that you also, we can also see that type of development uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll definitely uh, make a note of your comment. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We can go to the next slide. All right. So um, again, my name is Zapir. I'm the Director of Energy and Environmental Policy here at Pacific Corps. I'm going to go over the emissions um, analysis. My group uh, consults on consults on clean energy policy across our six states. We also um, have responsibility for reporting emissions to uh, Oregon DEQ and across other states. So, um, you know, as Randy already covered in his first slide, Pacific Core system is showing an aggressive decar decarbonization trajectory. Um, along with our parent company, uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, Pacific Core has a goal of reaching net zero in our retail sales by 2050 for our six-state system. So that's the that's the 
a starting point on our, our total system planning. Um, you know, that, that decarbonization that you see uh, includes uh, coal, re coal retirements and coal to gas conversions, among other factors. Now, when we're looking at the Oregon plan, we have to consider some unique factors um, to achieve the goals set by HB 2021. There are two, two elements to, to the plan that um, we had to work with. So we are showing significant load growth forecasts in Oregon. Um, and, and I will describe this in more detail, but the load growth, um, even under a situation where your relative emissions by megawatt hour are going down, because you're producing more energy to serve that load, your emissions are going up. Um, or you have to cut even more to keep up with that load growth. Um, the other effect of increasing load growth was that um, Oregon's overall capacity uh, contribution needed a, a larger amount of small scale renewable capacity added. Um, the other thing we noticed as part of the 2023 IRP planning is that coal to gas conversions were more economic. So under um, Senate Bill 1547, coal uh, facilities are excluded from serving Oregon retail sales starting 2030. So if those units had stayed as coal, those would be excluded from Oregon. But because they're now converted to gas, they're actually eligible to serve Oregon retail load. And so now you have this, fact, uh, this effect of more thermal resources are eligible and you also have a larger load. And as Matt was describing our allocations, uh, when, when a state on our system has greater load, they also take a greater share of available resources on the system, or at least that's how, you know, traditionally uh, we've been uh, managing it under the, so the current 2020 protocol is, and I'll, I'll refer to that as part of my presentation, is our cost allocation currently approved by the Oregon Public Utilities Commission. And um, while it's, it's limited in its timing, it ends, um, you know, at the end of 2024 can be extended, but it, it, it's time bound, but for the purpose of like a base assumption, we took those 2020 protocols and extended it through the planning horizon. Next slide, please. So a little refresher on HB 2021. Um, we are looking to reduce our emissions by 80% uh, by 2030, 90% by 2035, and um, having looking for 100% carbon-free retail electricity by 2040. Now that's measured against the baseline of our average actual uh, actual reported emissions in 2010 to 2012. Um, to Oregon DEQ. And so, you know, by coming back to this idea of how load affects this, at the time these targets were set, Oregon average load was around 13 million megawatt hours. By contrast, in 2023 IRP, we're projecting our load to be in the range of 20 to 23 million uh, megawatt hours. Uh, in, in, in the years 2030 through 2040. That's like a 60% load growth in 2030 and nearly 80% by 2040. Um, so this, this plays a major factor in our assessment of how we plan for the, uh, the Oregon CEP. The other thing that um, HB 2021 legislation did is that it increased the small scale renewable capacity that was originally set in AR 622 from 8% to 10% starting 2030. Um, next slide. Unless there are questions. Okay, I don't see questions. Okay, so for the purpose of measuring well, emissions. Excuse me. For, uh, uh, this is Phil Barnhart. Are you? Planning to talk about where this increased load is coming from, uh, wh why why that big increase after we had many many years in which load growth was non-existent or at least very low. So I can't speak to the specifics of the load growth or like the sources of the load growth. That, um, but the the load forecast itself is covered in the 2023 IRP publication. 
it's for commercial Great. loans. Thank you so that's, much. That's all I can. You're, you're welcome. Um, okay, so for Oregon Emissions Accounting, um, in actual, so when we get to when we're being measured on these uh, on these targets, we rely on Oregon DEQ regulations. Um, it's OAR 340 Division uh, 215. And there, um, I've included a link to the most recent DQ guidance on specifically for CP planning. Now, these rules are, are govern actuals reporting in the context generation that's already occurred and allocations that have, you know, are applied. Um, but because we're looking at a forecast for CP planning, DQ issued additional guidance that addressed some of uh, needed clarification in order to create forecasts. So I'll go through some of these key items. So um, for existing owned and specified resources, uh, we are using 2021 vintage emission factors supplied by DEQ. What that means is for existing resources, we're looking at their generation profile from 2021, convert that um, to an emission factor and then apply that to these resources um, for the planning horizon. Um, Oregon DEQ uh, requires uh, that unspecified purchases or market uh, purchases apply an emission factor, like it's a default factor used uh, pretty widely at 0.428 metric tons of CO2e per megawatt hour. I, I do want to note that, you know, as time progresses, it, there, it's highly likely that this emission factor for the region might get revisited um, as, you know, our Western energy grid becomes cleaner and whether this is still a relevant factor, it's more likely that by the time that we get to 2040 or even 2030, we may consider uh, looking at this factor differently. And so the emissions associated with market or unspecified purchases may be something less than this. For, for proxy resources or future resources that we are modeling, but we don't know what exactly um, what those are, we are using default emission factors that apply to that technology. So DQ provides us a list of default factors that could be used. Um, for the coal to gas converted unit that we are seeing on our system, there isn't a good default like generic emission factor. And so DQ guidance allows us to use something different and propose uh, basically our modeling results. And so we are going to um, do that. We're going to request an, uh, to use the IRP model emissions for the coal to gas conversion. It's, they are slightly higher than a normal gas unit would be just because of the, tech, the, the technology that you get with coal to gas conversions is different than a, a traditional gas unit. The other factors that are covered um, in uh, this guidance is multi jurisdictional utility emissions accounting. So for, for our system calculation across multiple states, um, the cost allocation methodology, uh, uh, the rules say that need to be approved by Oregon Public Utility Commission. So I see a couple of questions, but in, uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna keep going and I can come back to it. I see those are related to small scale specifically. Next slide, please. Okay, so for those of you who don't appreciate math as much as I do, um, you can feel free to tune out for the next two minutes. Um, I do want to walk through how the multi-state allocations work because I think it's an important part of understanding what we're doing in our um, planning and modeling. Um, and it's, it, it kind of explain sort of how we uh, approach designing our pathways to compliance. Okay, so um, we start with our system resources, so our, our, our fleet of generating resources, and then those are applied to Oregon or allocated to Oregon based on their cost allocation factor. So if a, a resource is CITES or completely allocated to Oregon, that will be 100% of that generation will be uh, attributed to Oregon. If it's something less than, it's the, the 
system emission factor, I'm sorry, the, the uh, system generation factor that's applied to that to create an Oregon generation profile in that green box. So on the second line is where we take the Oregon allocated generation and apply these DEQ supplied emission factors to get Oregon allocated emissions. On the third line, we take Oregon allocated emissions and then divide that by uh, Oregon allocated generation to get an average emission rate for Oregon resources. Um, that emission factor is then applied to Oregon retail sales and that purple box on line four is where we get the total emissions that are actually used to measure our performance against the HB 2021 target. Um, so effectively, the emission factor is used to prorate Oregon, you know, allocation of system to to meet to calculate Oregon retail sales share of emissions. Next slide, please. Okay, and so next couple of slides are kind of dense, so I will uh, I will go through them uh, from left to right, and we'll cover the assumptions that went into the, the analysis and then we'll look at the results. So we took the 2023 IRP preferred portfolio and we before the small scale renewable requirement was added and we allocated to Oregon to get Oregon's uh, emissions trajectory. So in that analysis we include no coal in tw starting 2030 and for 2040 forward, we're assuming um, no uh, allocation of thermal resources or market purchases as a mo post modeling assumption. Um, HB 2021 also um, says that emissions associated with qualifying facilities um, do not apply towards our emissions um, calculation. So those are also excluded. And again, what we have done is uh, assume for this analysis that the current 2020 cost allocation protocol, and it's 2020 because it was set in 2020, but it covers the next few years. Um, the 2020 cost allocation protocols are extended through the planning horizon. Um, and the way those allocations work, as the load grows, the greater share of the system resources get assigned to Oregon. So now looking at the chart to the right of the slide, we have the black line, which represents the emissions reduction target. So that's the 80% and 90% is the black line. And the performance of the portfolio is the orange line. Um, what you can see here, which is uh, really interesting, is that Starting with the 2023 IRP preferred portfolio, we're, we are um, seeing about 84% emissions reduction starting in 2023, I'm sorry, 2032 already. And so it's about 84%. So we're meeting the requirement between 32 and 34, and we're part ways to meeting that 90% from 35 to 2040. And, um, this, again, doesn't include the small scale renewables. So this is the starting portfolio in 2023 IRP. The next step is adding the small scale renewable requirement on top of that to get an Oregon capacity compliant portfolio. So next slide, please. So the results show that having done nothing else, we are meeting um, the targets in 2032 through 2034. Next slide. Here we're, we're looking at the results of the CEP portfolio. So what we're calling the CEP portfolio is the IRP portfolio plus the, that additional capacity to meet um, the 10% small scale requirement. Um, so all other conditions held equal. We have applied the 2020 protocols under the same constraints of, you know, no coal starting 2030 and, you know, no qualifying facilities emissions. Um, you can see that by adding, um, you know, 800 megawatts 
of small scale capacity. Um, I'm going to um, ask for your attention on the table below. And we don't have to sort of analyze all the numbers here. It's here for those who are interested, but I'll just point out a few things, just a way of a frame of reference. So the first line shows the capacity that's being added. The second line shows the generation resulting from that capacity and that generation is applied to Oregon at 100%. But you can see that um, the model also optimized thermal resources uh, to reduce uh, thermal generation um, by, by, by some amount. And you see the emissions reduction on the bottom line. And so the results are compared on the chart. So to the right, um, you can see that the green line is now the result of the CP portfolio as compared to the IRP portfolio. So there's a modest improvement in the emissions trajectory, but you know, we still need more work. Can we see the next slide, please? Again, just summarizing the results is, you know, adding small scale renewables. Uh, shows a modest improvement in our emissions, um, but additional work needs to be done to address the 2030, 31, 35 through 40 um, emissions reduction. Next slide. Okay, so from this point, we considered two pathways or two paths to meeting these targets. And these are um, alternative ways that we can um, achieve uh, these targets, depending on sort of how how the next few years um, play out. So in this scenario, we are uh, tapping thermal allocations to Oregon at a level that uh, allows for like supports the target. So um, so we're capping allocations on the thermal resources, but non-emitting resources are still allocated to Oregon on the same level they would be under the 2020 protocol. And I know this is not intuitive for everybody, so bear with me. Um, what that means is that you have a certain amount of thermal generation that's being uh, prorated pro and taken out of Oregon. But the t on the table below, it's important to note that the addition of small scale renewables, so that new SSR generation, you're bringing in enough small scale non emitting resources. So even when you take out the thermal generation, there's still sufficient amount of generation to meet Oregon load, um, at least on an annual basis. Um, and so that bottom line uh, in the table shows the emissions reductions that were achieved as a result of this approach. And the chart um, above shows what that result is of prorating thermal allocations to Oregon. And the blue line is above the target and it's above by a significant amount. So um, you can see we're actually achieving that 90% reduction um, much sooner. Next slide. Okay, so capping thermal allocations is one way of achieving these targets. It is um, a viable approach um, and it could actually be achieved in a number of different ways. It's, it's, it's pretty uh, flexible in how it can actually be applied in practice. Um, for example, coal to gas conversions could be excluded from serving Oregon categorically, or you can, uh, be, between the states, they can negotiate a specific unit um, to, uh, you know, come out of Oregon or to be assigned in Oregon early and then retired. So there's a number of ways that this is actually achieved across negotiations um, on our, between our six states. Next slide. Okay, so another uh, potential uh, pathway that we looked for uh, that could be set in place to achieve these targets is if this uh, new um, load growth is served by non-emitting resources. And so this analysis considers like existing Oregon load would continue to be served with our uh, system resources. 
and the, uh, the large new load growth is served 100% by non-emitting generation, um, whether that's through volunteer renewable options or um, you know, different allocations that could happen. Um, this does assume there's sufficient supply available to meet that customer, uh, the customer, or I'm sorry, not customers, the, the load growth that is um, assigned to Oregon. So it's important to note, though, that even under this condition, um, the some additional capping of thermal generation was still required. And part of that is, again, Oregon's experiencing load growth um, beyond sort of grouping of um, like the natural progression of load growth that was forecasted. So looking at the table below, you see that we do have the same data. You have the addition of small scale renewable that's adding generation. Um, you can see change in our thermal generation as a result of a uh, different allocation approach and the, the resulting emissions reduction. And so the yellow line, which is sort of hard to see there, but that's the line under this path to compliance. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this approach will achieve the targets as well. Um, it does require that small adjustment of thermal, re uh, thermal allocations, um, specifically in years 2031, 35, 37, and 39, but it's um, to a much smaller extent than we saw in the previous one. Okay, 